Okay, so before continuing our discussion about the um, development process, uh, uh, let me just point out uh, the next tasks uh, in this week, okay? So first of all, uh, remember that everybody who has an approved project, either green or yellow or approved via email afterwards, uh, you should uh, uh, fill the details in the second Google Doc, in the final document, okay? So that we can create the repositories for work. Remember then that the deadline for the next step or the next deliverable is uh, the end of this week. Uh, so uh, the sooner you, you give us the information, the sooner we create the repository and the sooner you can start uh, working on the next deadline, right? Um, first. Second, uh, as uh, Luigi already wrote on, on Facebook, uh, he, he started to create uh, the repositories for the groups uh, for which we already have information. So for every group, uh, we defined an acronym, a short name of your project, and we created two different repositories for each uh, project. Each repository is assigned uh, to the team members that were declared in, declared in the in the Google document. Right. So each of you will have, uh, should have received an email of invitation from GitHub. You need to confirm the um, belonging uh, to, the, to these groups, uh, and you can start working. You have two private repositories. One <coughs> is the name of the project. The second is name of the project dash code. The idea is that you can use uh, the first one as the repository hosting the website. So that, and that will be published uh, under uh, uh, a name, uh, github.io uh, uh, um, slash me 2017 slash name of the project. So that's why the short name should be used for the website. I tell you more details in a minute. The second one should be used for all the code. So for the Python code, for the application you write and so on. So use the second repository the dash code for developing your project uh, as a support for developing your project and the first one for developing the website. Okay? Both of them are private, so only you, only the member of your groups uh, can see the contents of these two repository except uh, <coughs> this one that when you publish uh, of course the contents uh, the website itself uh, will be visible to everyone. Hmm? But Okay, so uh, you already know how to use the repository for uh, creating code, creating... If, you, if some of you have any special needs about repositories, just tell us. We have uh, the possibility of creating further private repositories if you need them. Okay, but this is the basic uh, <coughs> uh, uh, repository that you have to start with. About the website, uh, which is also the, the goal for deliverable one, uh, we spend a bit, a, bit, a bit of time discussing it. So first of all, you need to create for the liberal one, for the end of this week, uh, a small website containing the vision of the project. GitHub already has the tools for helping you developing uh, uh, websites, and the information that you need is uh, listed on this page. So the tool that we are going to use is called uh, GitHub Pages. And you can find a very easy to follow instructions at this link, pages.github.com. Okay, that will tell you what to do for creating a repository, a web page. So it will, uh, just a video and so on, but uh, basically you, you will create a site for a project, not for the organization. And uh, you can start. So uh, GitHub allows you to publish the HTML code and create your own website. So you can either start from scratch and upload your code, as you would do with any static website, or maybe it's faster at the beginning, choosing a theme and starting from that. So. Uh, GitHub already has uh, some uh, uh, available themes to choose from in your project. So actually, with, 
a few clicks, uh, you can start uh, publishing a website from your project. Okay, actually, what you have to do is to go to the settings. Let's see it uh, uh, on, a, on a project. Where is that? Okay, so let's take this one, for example, which is an empty project, of course. And if you want to publish a website starting from this, you go to the project settings, go down, and to GitHub pages. It tells you that the repository is private, but the website will be public, of course. And uh, just to, to enable the publish, uh, publication of the website, you just have to select uh, where the site should be published from. They give you two options. Two options. One is uh, publishing from the master branch here, or from a subfolder of the master branch, a slash docs. The second option would be nice if you want to have a project where you have where you have some code and also website under the docs folder. But generally, since we have a repository only for the website. Uh, it's wiser probably to use the, the first option, only the master branch. I cannot click it right now because it's empty. So you need first uh, to load some content on this, on it. And then you can save and the website will be published uh, immediately with the content that you put. If you want, uh, you can choose a theme for the website uh, from uh, some, there are some predefined themes that you can choose from. Then you can always modify them later, but just not to lose too much time now in this week uh, by designing the CSS and the colors and so you can start from one of these themes, the one that fits best uh, your project, and with select team it will preload uh, this content on your website. And then of course you need to, to uh, customize uh, all the titles and all the links and, uh, and whatever. So, uh, in a couple of clicks, uh, In a couple of clicks, uh, so uh, enabling the publication of website and choosing a theme, you already have a, a public website. Hmm? That will be published under HTTP me2017.github.io slash name of your project. Hmm? Okay. So that will be the first step. And what do we publish on the website? <coughs> What we need to publish is described in this deliverable one checklist that we read together now. So this is the content. So every deliverable, every deadline from now on means that you are going to update that website and we are going to check the contents of the website every time, every for D1, for D2, for D3. Okay, every assignment is always Update the website with new information, with additional information. At any time, you can go back and correct and modify any previous versions. Okay, we, at any deadline, we will check it, let's say, from scratch altogether. And then finally also, at the exam, we will check again the website with the final contents. And we will only evaluate the last version at the exam date. Okay, so before that, you are free to modify, integrate, and so on. We have set some deadlines to help people, no, to help you to follow the, the work, the process. What happens if you miss a deadline? It's a common question. Nothing. So if you don't create the website in time for the end of this week, for the deadline, the only thing that happens is that we don't see it, we won't check it, and on Monday, next Monday, we will not give you any feedback because there's nothing there. No, no there will be no effect on the, on the exam score or whatever. The exam score will only depend on the content of the website uh, or end of the demo, end of the project and everything at the day of the exam or a couple of days before because we need to check it. Okay, so these deadlines are for enabling us to give you feedback. Then we can give you some feedback, some suggestions. You are free to implement them or not. Okay? Of course, maybe, probably, if you implement them, the project will look better. If 
if we, if we are able to give good suggestions to you. Okay, so it's actually, from now on, it's your project, it's not ours. Mm -hmm. So you, you, uh, you take care of it, uh, you take care of its website as your project. We can only help you giving some suggestion, pointing out something that maybe is not easy to understand, or, is not, or we see some risks for the future, maybe it's too complex or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the spirit. Okay, so uh, D1 will be the first version of the website. So I called it a checklist. It's not a template because it's not something to fill. Uh, you can create your website with the look and feel that you prefer as long as it contains uh, this information in one place or another. So create a website as you like, but we only will, we will check in the first step that the website will contain or should contain project information, the name of the project, the, ac the acronym of the project and the URL, of course, somewhere. The group members, oh, you already have this information, of course, from the Google Docs. You just have to put them into the web page format. And then uh, some contents about the project. So some vision statement, which is a sort of an expanded version from the brief description that you gave up to now. So it's a brief summary of what the system does for the users, this is the vision, and uh, just uh, as a checklist, just remember, uh, just check that uh, this vision statement should uh, explain or define the target environment. For many projects, we always get, we, we gave the suggestion, try to narrow your environment, narrow your scope. Think not in general, but in a specific space, in a specific location. So which is this location? Where is the project applicable? Defining the users. So not for a generic user, but for a specific user with a specific task. Hmm? If we narrow the context, it, it's easier to explain what the system does. Because then you have very well-defined or better-defined use cases. Possibly defining the stakeholders, so other people that could benefit from the project uh, without being involved directly in that, if, if it's the case, maybe it's not, not always. And explaining how the environment supports the users from the user point of view. This is the most uh, probably important uh, uh, sentence that you have to write. So why is it good for the users? And how does it help them doing something, being more sustainable probably, or happier, or or quicker, or uh, what benefit uh, you, the environment gives them. Hmm? And more specifically, what are the issues, the problems huh, that uh, we are solving? It's a, it's a system that does something for the users by overcoming a set of problems, by solving a set of issues. Hmm? And Okay, again, the benefits also for the users and for the environment. It's just sort of a repetition. In this phase, still avoid uh, as much as possible to describe the technology or, you, or especially making some technical choices. It's too early. We don't have any, enough information about the system to be able to tell whether there will be one or two computers, for example. We don't know yet. It depends. Okay? So nobody's asking us for all the information right now. Uh, right now, uh, it's about uh, the uh, functionality. Hmm? The suggestion is try to imagine selling it to a non-engineer. So you need to be, but not to a stupid person, an intelligent person who doesn't need to have the technical knowledge that we have. So you need to be precise, you need to be complete, but you need to talk about users and environment, not about uh, technicalities. Okay, or computers, or network, or sensors. So the idea is uh, more or less one page. So it's, so it's difficult to measure on a website, but uh, the idea is that this should not be longer than one page, otherwise it gets boring. Hmm? Okay, this is the vision statement, and then try you, some of you already did that in this first version, and try to explain why it's an, M an MEI project. So where is the sensing part? What is the reasoning? What is the acting? What is the interacting part of the project? So you can have a table, you can have some picture, you can have 
put them however you want as long as you point out uh, that the four MEI steps are present in your project. And second, we also ask to point that we also ask you to point out uh, which are the main MEI features that are developed in your project. As you know, as we already said, not every project will be able to be good or be very deep uh, in all of these features. So it depends on the nature of the project. So pick the ones uh, where your project uh, fits better, uh, where your project is more advanced, uh, maybe some project is more advanced on the sensitive part, some are more on the ubiquitous part or whatever. Uh, so go back, we have the definition on the slides. If you have some questions, you, can, uh, you, you are free to ask them, okay? So that at a glance, uh, we can see, we can check that this is indeed an MEI project because it has, it has all the steps covered and it has uh, several features covered. Don't try to force them, okay? It's acceptable that some features are not developed in your project. It's perfectly fine. So don't try to say that all of them are represented if they are not. So it's better to be strong on some points uh, than to try to, to do everything. And then there's a final section that we want uh, to have on the website uh, that we call uh, open issues or similar name if you prefer to change it. The goal is to keep track of the problems. So maybe you have everything clear in your mind about your project. No issues. I already know I could close my eyes and go st uh, straight to the end of the project uh, and have the implementation ready. Of course it's not. And uh, we have two kinds of, uh, of, uh, of uh, things that, that are in between our idea now and the finished project then. First, a lot of work to do. Okay, but this is, this is, 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 uh, is expected. It's nothing that we need to worry about. We know that there will be a lot of work. But in some cases, there are some issues, some items that are still not clear. I sti I'm still not sure whether I can, I don't know, measure this quantity with some sensor. I'm still not sure whether the user can do this. I'm still not sure about, uh, there are some issues that are still open because we don't know yet how to solve them. Or we don't have the knowledge to solve them. We don't, we know we need to, we understand that we need probably to, to seek out uh, and study or talk with some people or trying to, in some way, get more information. So the idea is to have uh, an open issues part on the website where you update these issues. So at the beginning, right now, some item will be an issue. Then once you have studied, solved it, then we longer, it will no longer be listed here. You can delete it. And maybe new issues will come out. So it's normal. As we evolve, there is something that is clear. It just needs just needs to work on it and some aspect that does, doesn't just need work it needs also some decisions to make some new knowledge to acquire and so on so what's the reason of of this uh, of this section first uh, to help you tracking the main problems okay should be you should have everything or most of it clear but some problems needs to be studied need to be faced and so you can keep track of them and you can return to that list uh, and uh, don't commit uh, to an implementation at least, uh, uh, until you solve uh, these main issues. But it's also useful for us because then we can read these issues and then may maybe we can know, I don't know, a professor at the Polytechnico who works on that field, a company in the incubator who is working on that field some documentation, some tools, some open source project uh, that can be useful in that area. So if you tell us what are the, the areas or the parts of your project where you have more questions or more uh, doubts uh, about how it, it, can, it can be solved, you can write them there. And if we have some suggestion, we can share them. We can put you in contact with the people, with maybe some people who knows more about that specific topic and could help you hmm? improve the project and solve the issue. Um, 
so this is the, the kind of uh, brainstorming that you we need you to ask about what's not except from work except from the implementation work uh, what is missing in our project vision what are the points that are not so clear right now maybe we on, we, have, we only have very general or big points uh, as we proceed they will become clearer so since we are checking the website every two or three weeks uh, if you keep this updated we can may, maybe have this interaction easier hmm? okay so these uh, are the four or five uh, sections in this checklist so it's not a, a lot of work actually so uh, basically you already have everything except uh, except the vision that you only have to expand uh, a bit the description and these open issues so it's not a difficult task huh, to do by the end of this week and yet you just have to put that into the html pages mm -hmm. but then we, we can improve that uh, with the with the next version and so on so the deliverable tool will uh, update the website with new information about the requirements you remember that last time we talked about the requirements uh, document okay we will discuss next monday in the lab probably if i remember correctly uh, the content of the website that we publish any questions on this okay uh, then okay then we can spend the, the remaining the remaining time having a look uh, at the rest uh, of the design process so if you remember our process we analyze together the different steps uh, up to the end of the liberal number two which is due in a month so it's not yet urgent not yet it will be at the beginning of may hmm? and what happens next so liberal two will be the functional and non-functional requirements so at that point we know what the system will do and what are the conditions the constraints for operating the system in the non-functional requirements and at that point uh, we start actually designing the system so if a function needs to be implemented how is this function realized what is the architecture of the system and the components uh, of the system so from the requirements uh, we should do a first design step oh, okay probably we already have something in mind uh, but formally it's impossible to define an architecture and architecture means uh, how many components you have how do they relate or communicate with each other what function what sub function each of these components implement and so on so it's difficult to reason about or to fix the architecture before before knowing or before having fixed the set of functional requirements and what is the architecture architecture is composed of a higher level system architecture and some more details about the hardware software and network components of this system architecture okay uh, if there is somebody from architecture here of course we in computer science use the word architecture in a quite different meaning uh, from the buildings uh, for, for us architecture is uh, the parts of a system and the relationship between these parts okay that will be mostly logical relationship or data relationship not uh, special relationship so that's uh, how, how we, we use this word so at the top level a system is described by its uh, system architecture what are the main system components and what kind of components do we have we have actually computational nodes is it a centralized system with only one computer is it a distributed system where we have a central computer and one or two smaller computers at the periphery is it a strongly distributed system where we have 17 different nodes of computation hmm? 
So what are the computing components? What, is, what are the sensors or actuators? What's the interface of the system with the real world? The system will need to have some sensors, some actuators. At that point, uh, we can decide, we can define which are the sensors that we need, uh, which are the actuators that we need. Because we already know actually and exactly precisely the functions that we need to implement. Huh? That's why we didn't talk about the specific sensors before. Because first we need to understand which data, which function we need. And only then, stupid example, I'm trying to control the climate of this room. Okay, I need to list which kind of control I need. And only then I can understand if the sensor that I need, if, if only one sensor is sufficient in one location or I mean or I need four in the four corners and what I what kind of measurement should I give temperature also humidity also uh, lightness also uh, airflow or pollution or co2 and it depends on the function that we need to implement we cannot choose the sensor before knowing the data that the algorithm will need the data that the system will need to implement a given functionality so what are the sensors that we need, what are the actuators, where do we need to install them, how to connect them, and so on. So we give some more detail. So the components are computational nodes, interfaces, sensors and actuators with the environment, interfaces with the user. So our system will be usable through a web page, or will be usable through a mobile application, or there will be a touch screen embedded in the wall, or uh, I, we, I will use it by uh, making some gestures in front of, uh, of a wall or, or in front of a, of a television or whatever. Huh? So what are the means of interfacing with the user? And finally, if we have more than one computational node or more than one user interface, what is the role of each of them? So of course the sensor can be a sensor because it only has one function right? measure some data an actuator only has some one function but the computer you can program it to do very uh, a lot of different functions so in your system you have a list of a lot of features and some of it will be implemented by one computer and some other function or some other features will be implemented by another computer so what is the partitioning of the functionality across the physical computational nodes. So in the architecture, you should see this decomposition of a list of features, the functional requirements, into a set of components that taken together are able to provide these features or these functions. So we need to, okay, I need a second computer for doing what? What's the computation of the first one? What is the second? A given function, where is it best to implement it? Where should it run? On the user mobile? On the Raspberry? On the cloud? On the server? Depends. So at this point, we are making this decision. We are making these choices. We are giving shape to the project by deciding how to implement each of the functions. So this was the first step, and the most important one. Having a, the big picture, of the system. At that point, uh, I still don't care probably whether my computational node is a Raspberry or a, is a laptop or is a small computer or maybe the brand of the sensor because we are thinking about uh, where they are, what they do, what they are needed for, and uh, how, they are, how are they connected with each other. Then we can separate the view by saying, okay, in the system architecture, we have everything together. Now we split the three main components, hardware, software, and network, which are the three legs uh, of any ICT system. Uh, at the hardware architecture, we can give more details about uh, the characteristics of the computational nodes, the characteristics of the devices, hmm, 
maybe not yet the brand and model, but at least the function, the precision, the uh, location, the type of me or measured quantities, and the user interface devices. Okay, so it's a more detailed view. The, arch the hardware architecture is just taking one at a time the different uh, nodes in the system architecture and explaining what they do and what characteristics do they have. The same, oh, this is quite easy because usually in the system architecture we make a picture, a diagram, and the different parts of this diagram correspond to these hardware components. A bit more complex is the software architecture, because software is not so easy to visualize, where we should try to identify the software modules, the different parts of the system. So there could be a module, for example, that stores uh, sensor data. So there will be a database, there will be a routine that pulls the data and stores them. There could be a module for handling, I don't know, user preferences. So it's a different software module. There could be a software for user interaction that, of course, probably will run on the mobile or on a web application. So try to identify, of course, not the individual functions or code, but by groups, different macro functions or, mod or software modules, and try to understand where you want to run each of these. So, uh, for example, uh, the, the system should be used by many users. Okay, this is, can, could be a non-functional requirement. The system can be used by many users. It's a quality of the system. It's not a specific implementation function. That implies that somewhere you have a user database. So there will be a, a module, probably, that you call user database or user data. Where do we put it? On which computer you, do we you host it? Do you host it in only one place? Do you replicate in many places? How do the, this information is shifted, is moved from one computer to another? And this is the kind of question we, you have. You try to allocate the different computational functions to the different architectural nodes. And of course, if you have two functions on two different nodes, they need to communicate in some way. So in, some, in this case, you are defining where you need uh, an interface, a programming interface, an API for one computer to call a function on a different computer. Okay, for example, in the example that you had in the lab, uh, you had to create an API to an external service. So the architecture is an application on a computer, an application on the, or a user interface on the mobile, and an external service on the cloud, uh, handling the messages, and the, the, the bot running on a computer, an interface running on a web page or on a, on a Telegram application. So that would be an example of an architecture with three different nodes. The user application, your Telegram application on the phone, the bot on your computer, and uh, the, the cloud services. Hmm? That, are, that exchange information in some way, and you see that you have some API, some methods, some specific methods to call for an external service. Right now, you, are, you, are, you have only consumed some extra API. You used some APIs provided by other providers. Later, we will learn to create our own APIs. So if you have a function on, your, on, your, on some node or some computer, you can expose part of the functionality to another computer in your system by offering an API that others can call. So we'll be able also to develop our own. And in the software architecture, okay, most of them, probably, most of these modules will be probably new software that we need to develop. But always seek out and try to understand whether you can reuse an existing component. I need a, a module for managing, you know, the user data or the user preferences. Is there anything ready already that they can use? Is there any project library I can use? Is there any cloud service I can use? So if I want to manage your schedule with appointments or data or 
probably don't want to implement a calendar because it's a lot of work. It's better to find whether I can find some calendar library or maybe I can integrate with Google Calendar with their APIs. Uh, so it's important, especially for the speed and easy uh, easiness of development of the, um, of the prototype to reuse as much as possible existing stuff. Okay, don't insist on rebuilding something that already exists. Try to integrate with them rather than rebuilding. And so in the software architecture, we also, of course, list uh, the libraries that we use uh, for our system. Hmm? So this is more complex because actually it's less obvious. The hardware architecture, okay, if I need to measure something, I need a sensor. Hmm? Maybe the difficulty is in finding the right type of sensor and uh, checking whether it can be, it's already integrated, uh, it does already have, uh, you know, a Bluetooth interface, or maybe you need the wire and understand the protocol, it's low level issues. But um, generally there are little choices about the hardware architecture. About the software architecture, it's a, a much more open field, where actually you have to, to make decisions about how your system will work. So, uh, in our uh, example of, uh, of a stupid project about uh, wake up system, uh, this could be an example of a, of a picture for describing the system architecture. Uh, so, you remember the feature of the system where it gives you a personalized, uh, a customized wake up uh, to your preferences in your location and so on. It means that I have a a user phone that delivers information to the user. There is some music in the room. There may be some music in the room if the user is at home that gives information to the user. The user should be able to interact with the phone for stopping the wake up or for setting the time over the phone or over a web interface. All the information should, should be centralized somewhere that hosts all the data, all the schedule, because the system must be running even, even when the phone is switched off, for example. We should integrate with the user schedule, so an external service like Google Calendar, and should be add some sensors in the environment. So this is the general architecture, system level. Each of these blocks uh, is either a sensor or a computational node uh, with some software in it or an actuator. And uh, if we go down to the hardware level, we ask ourselves, okay, in this picture, what are the hardware components we need? So, of course, we need some sensors, sensors of movement, for example, in the room to check whether people are moving, are awake, or maybe sensor for understanding whether the person is in the bed, some weight sensor, I don't know, a movement sensor. And... Uh, Remember that the system should be running even without the phone. So these sensors must in some way be connected to the central server. The central server is not in the bedroom. It's somewhere else, somewhere central. So how do I connect a sensor in my room with an external server somewhere else? I can't. Unless the sensor already is uh, internet enabled, so it has a Wi-Fi or a, a, a 3G connection, so it's able maybe to push data somewhere. Otherwise, it's just a, a dumb uh, device that you need to connect uh, to some local, local computer. So you need a local gateway, a small PC, just for collecting the data from the sensors and sending them to the central gateway. We need this hardware. We can't rely on the user phone for doing this function. First, because the phone is not reliable in our system. We should be able to operate without it. And second, probably the phone doesn't have all the connections or the protocols for speaking with the sensor. If you have a sensor that speaks the you know, Z-Wave protocol, OK, your phone doesn't have the Z-Wave antenna. And so you cannot directly interact with that. 
So we, you need a, an intermediate node that you can program that could be in some way programmable by you, by you and is able to be connected to the sensors, collect the data, and send them to the centralized server. Of course, details are needed later, but uh, for now we, un we understand that this picture is missing one component, some local integration computer. Then we have the phone, we have a server somewhere. Where is it? A, a physical machine? Is, a, is there a physical machine per house? So if me and you both have this system, we should both have two different machines, one for me and one for you, or can be a shared machine, or even virtualized somewhere. Does it need to be physically connected to me? Do I need uh, to have a fast, quick, and reliable connection? Or it can be remoted? So we need to revise, especially the, the non-functional requirements, to understand where can it be merged with this local gateway? So if we decide that uh, I need a server for each user, so a computer doing the server function for each user, then probably I can merge it with the local gateway if they, in any case, need to be both physically in my home. Otherwise, uh, it can be anywhere as long as it's uh, always connected and always on. So I need something cheaper in my house uh, and something maybe more powerful. At this point, it would be shared by many users. Our idea is that the, in this architecture, we only have one of these for everybody and a replication of this Le uh, lower level for every user. So always, we will only create one prototype. But in defining the prototype architecture, we should always think about how to scale this. If I want to replicate in, it in three places, do I need to copy everything or are there some shared components? Okay, this is the kind of questions that we ask ourselves when designing the system architecture. And the music. What do you know, that, uh, what do we use for playing music? Can we use the phone? Yes, we can. But when the phone is not there, what can we use? An Wi-Fi system? A Wi-Fi, a Bluetooth uh, um, speaker? Yes. And the Bluetooth speaker, where does it get music from? We need a PC with Bluetooth or even a Raspberry with a Bluetooth associated to the device so that we can, able, we can be able to play music and so on. So we try to get, you know, in detail, more concrete about uh, how to deliver the function. So you see a shift. Until uh, deliverable 2, until the functional requirements, we were only concerned with uh, what the system will do. Now we are discussing how the different features can be implemented. How, meaning with uh, what organization, with what hardware components, and what uh, software components. So uh, we need to collect some data, so we need a, a software module that reads data from the sensors and sends them to the central server. Or maybe, okay, should I send the raw data from the sensor to the server? Or should I read the sensor data do some computation locally, and then send the results of the computation to the server. So for example, if I have a, a weight sensor under the bed, do I send every 10 seconds the weight value to the server? Or do I analyze it locally and I send to the server only events like, okay, the new people is in the bed, a person has left the bed, and so on. Maybe send only the, the deltas. Uh, when this value changes uh, more than a given threshold. So if I, if I can do more local computation, I can save a lot of bandwidth, and, can, and I can, let's say, reduce the load on the central server. It doesn't, it doesn't need to, be, to do all the computation. Some of the computation can be done locally, and some remotely. Hmm? There's today a lot of discussion about uh, which is the best architecture for the Internet of Things uh, 
whether it's a cloud architecture, so everything done by the server, and uh, what you have locally is just stupid uh, for, sending, for reading data and sending it out, or today you are starting to think about uh, edge architectures, or they call them also fog computing. Fog is not cloud. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a low, uh, smaller version of a cloud, a fog. Uh, or edge, uh, by saying that the computation is not centralized, but it's on the edge of the network, so it's towards the user. So local computers do some useful computation. They're not just for sending or receiving data. Hmm? So finding the right balance is not trivial. Uh, of course, the music, we need to have some music server. We need to play music, okay, but it won't be the same MP3 all over again. Probably you have a, a, a set of playlists uh, that can be also modified according to initially something soft and then it's, go, it's becoming uh, louder and louder until some very hard rock plays when you're real late uh, and so on. So we need to have some flexible software for playing different mu music. We need an application on the mobile phone for sure. So it's a software that needs to be developed. We need a web application on the central server where the user can analyze their settings and so on. And the uh, central server should be able to store some data and run all the intelligence. So as you see, I try to list the different uh, macro functions, the different big blocks of functions that should be implemented by the software. And for each of them, I listed where they should run. So where should they should be deployed, on what hardware. So I, I try to map the software function to the hardware component. And last point is uh, the network architecture. We take it somewhere from, somewhat from, for granted sometimes, so that every everything will be connected. And uh, the experience uh, tells me that uh, many of you didn't have uh, or the, uh, haven't studied yet uh, the computer networks course. So from the, the, those from electronics didn't, don't have this course and from the computer side probably they're following that uh, in parallel with, with this one if I'm not wrong. Or, and uh, so there is, uh, of course we, we can help you, There's, it's not uh, so easy always to have everything running. So probably if you have your application on the, on the, on the smartphone and the smartphone is connected with the Wi-Fi of the Polytechnico. So it, the Wi-Fi filters a lot of protocols. So not all data can pass through. We can only use some ports or some, some protocols. If you have it uh, connected with, a, with your 3G SIM, with, the, with your uh, mobile operator, then probably it will not block, but it will change your IP address every now and then. So it's very difficult to have an IP address, a fixed IP address. And uh, the same for the Raspberry. If you put, if you connect it to the, to the Ladispa network, it will give you only a local address. So uh, it's not easy to make every component visib visible by the others because you need to set up all the network addressing and routing. Okay? That's why in many cases uh, we we use the Wi-Fi network uh, that we publish in the lab. Now you know that we have the access point uh, with our MEI network, the MEI course uh, uh, Wi-Fi network, where we have the full control over the addressing. We don't have any filters like in the, in the, in the Edurom or Polito Wi-Fi networks and so on. Uh, uh, we can also physically connect uh, probably some device with a cable if we, don't, we, we, if we need it. Uh, if we, need, we can give you some fixed IP address uh, for your Raspberry or for a phone probably also, uh, depending on the needs of the project. So we can, we have some small router and access point in the lab that we can configure to support the needs of the project. Okay, uh, so that's uh, about uh, the IP addressing and the, and the connection. The other issue is, uh, um, so for example, say the central server in this case should, should have a, an, a, um, an IP address accessible by the public. You don't get it if you connect to the local network. Huh? In our router, there is one IP address that we asked uh, to be visible or even from outside the Polytechnico, so we can uh, use that uh, for your project if you want. Huh? So uh, we need to be a bit careful about uh, the addressing. And 
so this is the first issue the ip networks need to be configured and routed correctly in order for every component to see the others what happens usually is that at your home everything works correctly because you have your wi-fi in your home and everything is, is under the same local network when you come to the Politecnico, it stops working because there are a lot of filters uh, in the network so we need to plan it carefully second not everything is wi-fi Many or most of the devices, sensors and actuators, don't have a, a Wi-Fi interface. Some have a Bluetooth interface, uh, which is a, not a real network. It's only a serial line over the air. Some are very specific networks, like the Z-Wave or Zigbee network, hmm? which are networks. But they're not a normal IP network. Just, you, don't, you, you just don't bridge them. Uh, you need a special controller to read them, to interface with them, and so on. And so understand the API of that controller to uh, read or write the data to that specific network. If you have, uh, you know, some part of a system on an Arduino board because you need to interface with some sensor, how do you connect them? You create a serial line. You put some, you take a, a Wi-Fi enabled Arduino and you talk them with the Wi-Fi and IP. So it's something that needs to be designed. If, if I have different components, they all need to talk to each other to exchange data. And so we, we must define what is the, the connection technology, Ethernet cable, Wi-Fi, 3G, or Z-Wave, Zigbee, so a, a smartphone protocol. And uh, where are you connected to? What is your addressing? And so on. So it's more detailed, of course. The important part is the system, hardware, and software architecture. But when it comes to putting everything together, also these items should be solved. Hmm? Okay, so right now what do we have? We have uh, the, f uh, the um, complete view of what the system will do. And we have a pretty good plan or overview about how the system will be organized what is the architecture what is the structure what are the main components what are the main software so we have a sort of a shopping list of what we need to buy and what we need to implement the next step would be in our case the component selection so going to the detail especially about the hardware uh, in many cases, this step, which is logically separate, this distinct from the architecture definition, usually we do them together. Because we need to iterate and say, oh, I imagine having a, a sensor like that. Okay, let's find the specific sensor that we need. We, f we search the internet, we search the data sheet, we search the lab, we don't find exactly the sensor that we want. So we need to change the architecture because the kind of sensor that we find uh, has a different interface uh, or has, a, has different features and so on. So I usually go back and forth between the definition of the architecture and the kind of component that I have for implementing that architecture. Or I decide that I store this information on the Raspberry and then I find out that this information is too big, it's too large to be stored locally, so I will move it somewhere else. So I change the architecture because of some limitation of some computational nodes, and so on. So the output of this component selection is actually a sort of a bill of material, the list of items that are needed. It's important at this point to select carefully the components. Can we implement, especially in the hardware side, can we implement something by using off-the-shelf components, which, which is ready, which is already interfaced in some way? Or do we need to create a custom component? Hmm. Of course, uh, as much as possible, try to use the left side. Only if you don't find anything in the budget or within a reasonable budget and uh, uh, with the a, with a, with a functionality that you need, uh, so only, only if you don't find them, try to think about custom development. So custom development means uh, 
buying the components uh, and soldering them into a board or making a, a, a prototype and uh, linking that to the to, to an Arduino with some resistors and capacitors and uh, integrated circuits and so on. Okay, this is the, our last resort. If needed, we will do that. But if possible, we'll try to uh, use as much as possible, let's say, complete components. First, uh, to, to be more efficient, not to waste too much time on hardware development. And second, also for com communication um, possibilities. If I already have a, I don't know, a Z-Wave uh, sensor, then it already have all, all the it already has all the protocols for reading the data, for polling at a given time interval, and so on. We only need to interface it with a computer with a Z Wave controller. That's it. If I use the same sensor, if I buy the component for the same sensor, then I need not only to create the circuit to to give power to it, to read data from it, to clock it, and then I need to devise how to communicate outside. So do I put a serial, do I put a microcontroller for pulling the data, and with what protocol? And which functionality do I implement in this protocol? Read one sample, read uh, periodically. So I need to buy everything, to, to build everything. And especially I will, I will end up with some sensor which has less functionalities than a complete off-the-shelf component. So as, as much as you like soldering items, uh, Try to think them as a last resort. So this is more or less uh, the the, um, the flowchart that I imagined uh, in this uh, component selection phase. We have the system architecture, so we have the list of hardware components and the functions that they should Im implement. Uh, and for each component, we decide: okay, do we have an off-the-shelf component or a do-it-yourself component? Do we I, do we already have a complete existing working sensor or actuator for this or do I need to create one so in that case the bill of material in the first case the bill of material will just contain I need this sensor it's already in the lab or it's not in the lab but it's on the market in the other case uh, we need to make to open a sub project uh, to design and implement uh, that specific component that would be probably uh, some board with a CPU or a microcontroller, some electronics and sensors, some uh, passive and active electronics, and so on. Hmm? And at the end, everything adds up to the bill of material, to the list of, of, of components uh, that must be bought. At this point, uh, this point will be in the middle of May, when we have this information, you, we can also check, we should also check whether these materials are already available in the lab. Or otherwise, uh, we should buy them. We have a small, a small budget that the sponsor companies uh, uh, gave us, or you know, at least uh, they set it aside for us, a budget for buying some components, some devices. So if, you, if your project actually needs a specific sensor or a specific actuator that we don't have in the lab, we can go to the, uh, to the sponsor and say, please, uh, can, could you buy us this component? Hmm? Of course, uh, if it's something that costs 10,000 euros, you can forget about that. Huh? But if it costs uh, 50, 80, 120, or something like that, probably we can do that. Not for every project, probably, but, uh, huh? or maybe you can find uh, a device that works for more than one project uh, so that it will stay in the lab for the others. Uh, we can share it. But uh, let's try not to be, okay, we are, as always, we are limited by budget, uh, but not too much, okay? Or especially we are not limited just by the equipment that we have in the lab, okay? Of course, uh, before going out uh, and buying something, we must be sure that that is the best choice. So there is no other solution, easier or more cost effective for your project. Mm. That's why only at this late stage we think about the component. If you start looking for sensors today, you will have no criteria for choosing one against the other. So probably the, you would have the risk of buying the wrong thing. 
or wasting money. Hmm? So first we need to understand exactly what is the role of the sensor and how we can be replaced with, by something different if we don't find exactly what we, know, what we want. And only for doing that, for, this, for reasoning about this replacement, we need to understand the functions that are supposed to be done by that sensor. Okay, all of this uh, will land uh, in deliverable tree. End of May. Deliverable tree will contain, so will be the third update to the website. So the first is the end of the of this week. The second will be at the end of April with the functional and non-functional requirement. And the third one, the, the third and final update uh, would be before the 20th of May with the system architecture software components and hardware components uh, by identifying the, the off-the-shelf ones uh, and the ad hoc ones. Hmm? So all of this, last, uh, this last step, last design step uh, will take place uh, between the, the, the beginning of uh, May and the 20th of May. And uh, this uh, completes the design phase. So right now we have all the information. We know what the system will do. We know what the computers we have, what sensors. We have the list of hardware that we need. We have the list of software modules to be implemented. We know how they can or they should communicate with each other. So what are the interfaces, the software interfaces that we need to implement. So it's time to, to start implementing. Probably you already started implementing some parts before, but at that point, uh, there's nothing more to do than implementation hmm? so implementing the hardware if you have some do it yourself hardware or configuring the off-the-shelf hardware developing the software will, that will be at this point a major task to do and do the integration of the different points the, diff the different components uh, with interfaces with the network and so on at this point probably it's better for you to organize the work uh, by giving different tasks or, or splitting the project into different for, uh, into the different components of the group, so a component uh, is able to work on, on a part, another per, another pe another person can work on a different part of the system, and so on, according to the skills, according to the availability, and so on. Hmm? And of course, we can split quite easily the work be, be, because all the project is already well defined, so there's no discussion anymore at this stage about okay where do we implement this function or what is the system supposed to do in this situation uh, should already be in the previous de deliverable so right now we are just trying to implement uh, whatever you promised in deliverables two and three there you have a list of functions a list of components a list of so so software modules that is your work laid out in front of you so you just have pick up a module and start implementing it and so on hmm? in the simplest version. So at the end of this phase, uh, we have all the hardware and all the software implement, uh, implemented and the system is probably ready to run. Of course, also this implementation phase uh, is composed of software development and hardware development. In the case of off-the-shelf hardware, it's easier because you just have to install the components, uh, whether they are sensors or actuators or user interfaces. In the case of do-it-yourself components, it will be more demanding here. And for the software, also probably we'll have some software for managing the sensors, some software parts for managing the actuators, some, sof some software parts for doing the intelligence, and some for managing the user interfaces, all the interactions. Hmm? So there are different software components. And you see that you start from these documents that are D2 and D3. And you end up with implementation. While you start implementation, there is a final deadline, which we have in this uh, process, during the class of May 25, the 25th of May, where you will give a presentation about your project. We call them the final project review because, the, okay, it's more or less the same information that you have on the 20th. It's just a few days later. We, we give you feedback on the 22nd, 
and for the 25th uh, you just prepare a five minutes presentation no more than five minutes so you come here one at a time and uh, present your project we will give you a, a template some 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 guidelines for the presentation and uh, we will invite that day all the companies and industries and startup that we have contact with to come listen to your projects uh, and give you some some feedback what will happen is that uh, we will give to every person of the industries that come here a questionnaire with some simple, simple questions like uh, what are the good points, the bad points of this project? Uh, what do you think it can be? How can it be improved? Uh, or what is the market potential that you have? Very simple questions. So every people that come from the Eastern industry here, they will listen to your presentation and they will fill this questionnaire. I will then collect this questionnaire and give them to every group, okay, to each group. And second, what we are trying to plan is also some sort of a question and answer session. We should organize it in a way that it's quick, it's not too long because we only have this, the three hours for all the groups. Uh, so the idea is that uh, every company that attends the presentation will have maybe one or maximum two questions to ask uh, to one of two groups. Uh, that they decide, they will select. Okay, I want to make a question to that group, okay? So that, uh, or a suggestion, or a question, or, or maybe create a contact saying, okay, this project is interesting for me, let's talk again outside. Oh, let's ex exchange our contacts uh, so that maybe, maybe we can follow you or we can provide you some components or something like that. So I'm trying to create, uh, first to exploit these companies uh, for giving you some feedback, some information, and also possibly to create some links, uh, early links between you and the companies. Of course, there are some of these are also the companies that are sponsoring with money, the project, the, the course. Some are just interested, so they don't want to, to spend money, but they will, they want to keep, uh, to be involved in any way. Hmm? Okay, of course, there's no implementation without testing. So, you always think that when you have finished the implementation, the work is done. But it's never so. Once you finish the implementation, the, pro the problems will start. Uh, you put everything together and it doesn't work. So it's normal, OK? Uh, my suggestion is just allow some time for debugging. And don't, try, don't plan to finish the last day before the exam because then something will not work, uh, and then we'll, you will get crazy in the last days to fix everything. Try to do incremental development. Put in something together, see whether it works, uh, then add some functions. Always, always try to add something running. Partial, but running. And then you add. So if something goes wrong, you can also always go back one step uh, and don't just say, uh, get crazy in the last day if, uh, if, if uh, nothing works. Okay, but you will realize how much time goes into test and debugging compared to the time needed for development. Usually it's 50-50. If, if it took one month to develop, probably it will take one month to debug it and to have it running. Of course, we don't want to first develop and then debug. We should intermix. Every line of code that we write, start testing it. Soon, immediately. Don't do it tomorrow. Otherwise, tomorrow will be the end of the weeks, and then will be the end of the month, and will immediately become the day before the exam. When you have a long list of problems that hmm, during the demo, five minutes before, I'm trying to fix this, uh, let me restart it because it, uh, it only works for the first time, and so on. <laughs> so it's better to have one functionality less properly tested rather than adding new functionalities and then and having them only work. Uh, once in a moonlight. Hmm? Okay. Um, and of course, uh, as I said, nothing is fixed. We can always go back and change something, especially in the right part. If we find at the end that in the, in the, in the implementation there is some unexpected problem, and we can maybe 
work harder to solve this problem or we can go back to the architecture and change architecture a bit to avoid that problem to create workarounds so that, that the problem doesn't show okay it's our project so we are transparent so we declare the different steps on the website but we can always go back to change them if there is any reason to do so as long as the project at the end is consistent uh, so don't be afraid of going back and changing one function because that, because later in the process you discover that it's harder than you thought and uh, the more you loop the better okay so you implement something then you add then you implement some other bit and so on always in this uh, Im big implementation loop okay uh, as we said this long process maps to this uh, four big phases vision analysis design and implementation for one two three the deadlines are as listed for four the implementation the deadline is the exam what I left out from this picture is the requirement elicitation phase we say that it would be important to give uh, to have feedback from real users and go make interviews and so on well, but really we don't have time no? until uh, in the, so that is not formally required and also the testing and validation I left it out because uh, I know what happens uh, and um, very often there is not so much time to do the, this testing and try to just do it before during the implementation because you won't have some time for testing the system when it's finished you can only test it while you develop it so we are sort of simplifying leaving out uh, uh, leaving um, out uh, the requirement of the situation and minimizing the testing phase uh, because at the end we only have uh, we only need to have a working prototype and not a real robust system okay uh, this is something that you already said that everything will be traced on the github websites uh, and we will revi revise them in those days okay so that's all for today remember to fill the details on the google documents if you already didn't do so hmm?